So of course you don't go out and build an SKA straight away. There are a number of uh, technology demonstrator projects um, on the go. So in Australia, CSIRO is building what's called the Australian SKA Pathfinder. It's going to be 36 antennas, which is around about 1% of the SKA. It's been built at the Murchison Observatory and it's costing about $110 million. Uh, this is the telescope that, that Peter mentioned in the, in, in the introduction that, that I'm managing at Curtin University. This is called the Murchison Wide Field Array. Uh, if you recall the movie, uh, this uses antennas like the ones that just sit flat on the ground and are electronically steerable. So this is a consortium of uh, countries involved, Australia, US, India. Uh, it's about a $30 million project. It's also being built uh, at the Murchison Observatory. And the main science that, that we're building this for is to look back to the dark ages of the universe. So this is a telescope designed to observe hydrogen in the very early universe. And uh, it's already operational, so we have a nice a uh, few nice images of the, of the sky. This is about 30 degrees across. So this is a very wide field instrument. You get massive slabs of the universe in one go. So this is demonstrating the low frequencies for SKA. ASCAP's demonstrating the high frequencies and they sit next to each other, so they're, they're quite complementary. Uh, but the SKA is a hell of a lot more than just antennas. SKA is going to push the envelope in virtually every area of technology. So you've got to power this instrument. It's sitting out in the middle of nowhere. There's no grid power. So you've got to generate your own. So, so we're seriously uh, developing uh, green energy solutions for the SKA. So photovoltaics, wind, other options. Um, and the federal government has funded $47 million to look at um, or provide a, a green energy solution for the, for the prototype telescopes we're building now. I mentioned the vast data rates that we need to send across the country. So a little bit hard to see, but our telescopes are up here. Uh, we've got a fibre route to Geraldton and then on to Perth which is uh, specced up at 8 terabits per second. So this fibre will take all of the data from the Pathfinder telescopes on the site, uh, bring it down to Perth in real time, where it's all going to be archived and processed and the data managed on a, a new um, high-performance computing uh, facility, also funded by the federal government, an $80 million supercomputing centre that, that sits in Perth right across the road from my office actually, so very nice. Is it built It's getting there, yeah. So it's not just astronomy and physics, it's green energy, it's incredibly advanced networking, it's really bleeding edge, high performance computing. Uh, you have of order 10,000 antennas, so your civil engineering, your mechanical engineering, your maintenance strategy, all of the really practical things have to be nailed down. So SKA is really pushing the envelope in many, many different directions. This is why I think it's a, it's a great project. Um, astronomy is sort of like the draw card, but as a project to train young engineers and young network engineers and computing people, as well as physicists and mathematicians. This is just like the ultimate toy for people like that. So in terms of advanced training, advanced research, this is really, uh, really a, a, could be an extremely good project for Australia. Right, so I do need to say a word about the competition. Uh, so we are in a competition with, uh, with uh, South Africa and a consortium of African countries. Uh, so this is Africa. Uh, the core site would be in the Northern Cape uh, region of South Africa. 
a place called the Karoo. And you can probably just see it, but the distribution of antennas heading northward uh, across the rest of the continent to achieve uh, close to the 3,000 kilometre uh, distribution that you need. Uh, this is just a, a zoom in of um, their central core area. Um, and they're also building an SKA uh, precursor telescope called Meerkat, uh, which will in some ways be uh, sort of similar to ASCAT, but have some, some different technology choices. So the South Africans have a quite a good site as well. I, I don't think it's as good as the Australian site, uh, simply from the point of view of the radio interference. Um, there are several towns around the central site. They have a much larger uh, population density than, than we do at the site in Western Australia. Uh, another nice aspect of Australia is that you can uh, implement the full 3,000 kilometres under a single federal jurisdiction. Uh, in Africa, you obviously need to go into many countries to the north of South Africa, which just makes life uh, more complicated. So I think we have some good advantages. Um, there's a very detailed um, selection process underway at the moment, and the site decision will be uh, made in early 2012. So this is, this is where we're at at the moment. Uh, it's been a 20-year project up to this point, just to get design parameters, consortia together, all sorts of practical stuff, cost analysis, etc. At the end of 2011, the preliminary system design will be complete and we'll embark upon a three-year program to do the final uh, detailed system design. Uh, that three-year program um, is being funded by the international community. It's around about a 90 million uh, euro uh, design effort. Uh, so that will include detailed design and prototyping. Uh, at the beginning of that process, in the first half of 2012, we'll have the final decision on the site, whether it's Australia, New Zealand or S Southern Africa. And in 2015, uh, we would start construction of SKA Phase 1, which would be around about 10% of the instrument and would cost around about 350 uh, million euro spread over about 10 countries, uh, the funding spread over 10 countries. Uh, about 2020, phase two uh, construction would, would take place and that would build the instrument out to full 100% uh, capacity and that might be complete by about 2025. So luckily that's still pre-retirement for me, so I'm still in with a show of doing some science with the SKA. So I just wanted to end on uh, a practical note. So I've talked about fundamental physics and I've talked about how that underpins uh, basically technology development. Uh, so this is, this is really just one example, not of that direct relationship, but more how um, designing and building advanced radio telescopes can lead to uh, very significant innovations. So how many people know this story? Anyone heard about this? A few people. So this guy, uh, Professor John O'Sullivan, uh, works at CSIRO. Uh, he's a, uh, an honorary doctor at, at Curtin University. Um, has always worked in radio astronomy instrumentation. Around about 30 years ago, he and a few mates were wondering how you'd go about detecting exploding black holes just for the hell of it, it's interesting, it's interesting physics. Uh, they started using the current state-of-the-art equipment, which was um, pretty crude, and, and John thought there must be a better way to do this. So he sat down and, and thought about how you might uh, implement things a lot better and faster and easier so that he didn't have to spend so much time working with the equipment. And he basically invented a microchip implementation of what's called a fast Fourier transform, which is a very common operation in radio astronomy signal processing. 
So that was fine. Uh, he sort of did a few jobs, moved on, and in one of his next jobs, he developed a very deep understanding of radio astronomy calibration, the sort of underlying signal processing that you need to do. And after about 30 years of sort of mulling all of these things over, he and the team at CSIRO sort of had that aha moment where they said, we can turn this into a method of wireless communication that will be very fast, very cheap, very efficient. And so they, they invented the 802.11 uh, wireless uh, communications protocol. So who here uses a mobile phone? Gee, no one. <laughs> the, the grade five students I talked to this morning, they all put their hands up. I can't believe you guys are. <laughs> so mobile phones, laptops, increasingly just about every single device that's being manufactured has wireless capability. Every single one of those devices uses this guy's invention that arose out of thinking about how you might detect exploding black holes. So just an example of how sitting down and thinking about hard problems, doesn't really matter what they are, can lead in completely unanticipated directions. And this is, this is a ubiquitous, fundamental technology of modern life. So just an example of, um, of how radio astronomy has, has done this in the past. John is now working on some of the fundamental electronics for the SKA Pathfinder ASCAP. And again, he's probing things that are probably going to have massive spin-offs uh, down the track. So over the history of radio astronomy, you might think that a billion dollars spent on a, a telescope is a lot of money. But if you add that up against the number of wireless devices that are sold annually around the world, it's an absolute drop in the ocean. It's the loss leader. Plus you get to understand the universe. <laughs>